following a stroke, there are several complications to be aware of. The patient may have brain edema or increased intracranial pressure, which can have a detrimental effect on the outcome of that patient. This occurs due to cellular swelling, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, leaking of cerebrospinal fluid from the ependymal lining, as well as from cellular debris causing an increased osmolality in that affected region. This then causes movement of water into the affected space. Symptoms include headache, dizziness, nausea and vomiting, and you may have signs such as papilledema and a gradual loss of consciousness. Because of the increased pressure, there is also a risk of obstructive hydrocephalus or herniation. Manitol was previously used to reduce intracranial pressure in these patients. However, a recent study has shown that this may even increase the in-hospital mortality. Other potential therapies include hyperventilation and diuretics, and some sources also specify steroids, although the evidence is controversial. Surgery involving a craniotomy where the skull is temporarily lifted can also help to reduce the intracranial pressure. Ischemic strokes can give rise to a hemorrhagic transformation, especially after thrombolytic treatment. In the case of hemorrhagic stroke secondary to a subarachnoid hemorrhage, there may be vasospasm following the initial bleed, which can then generate infarction, which is essentially a secondary stroke. To counter this, a calcium channel blocker such as nimodipine may be given, and in the acute setting, the patient may be given acute volume expansion and vasopressors in an attempt to increase cerebral blood flow. Infections are another complication of stroke. Pneumonia can be due to post-stroke paralysis, where the patient is not able to move well and can suffer atelectasis, which is a collapse of part of the lung. This generates an environment that microbes can grow in, leading to pneumonia. Additionally, due to swallowing difficulty, the patient may be more prone to aspiration, and therefore aspiration pneumonia. Urinary tract infections are also common, especially in patients who have an indwelling catheter placed. This is because patients with stroke have an increased risk from immunosuppression, bladder dysfunction, and of course the use of the catheter itself. Additionally, the fever and systemic inflammatory response associated with the urinary tract infection may impair stroke recovery. Next, we have complications due to immobility. We already mentioned the contribution of immobility to atelectasis, but there are others, such as pressure sores or ulcers, as well as deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Patients are not generally put on anticoagulation medication following a stroke, either because the stroke was originally hemorrhagic or due to the risk of hemorrhagic transformation in an ischemic stroke. Due to potential muscle weakness, there is also a risk for falls. Pain and contractures are next. In some instances, due to the loss of the inhibitory input from the central nervous system onto the peripheral nerve fibres, patients can experience increased tone and therefore contractures. These may require physiotherapy or a brace in order to reduce any pain. If they are not working, GABA-enhancing medications such as baclofen may be used to enhance the inhibitory input and reduce the tone. Pain can also be exacerbated by inappropriate handling of the patient during transfer. It's also important to consider the psychological complications of a stroke, which includes anxiety and depression, with approximately one-third of patients manifesting post-stroke depression.